how long it lives, where it moves to. And then we also do a lot of work with caterpillars. And so we have a big operation to grow us the caterpillars. We can grow, uh, caterpillars are more likely to survive with us caring for them in a greenhouse than they are in the wild. And so we can grow big numbers and use that as a stock for restoration. Okay, so that's the brief overview of what we do. And I just need to give you some context for where this butterfly lives, which is important later in the story. Um, this butterfly lives in wetlands along streams. So that's a picture of one of its grassy wetlands is more or less what the habitats look like. But they're in small populations that are spread across the stream. So these um, green dots here might be an acre or two acres. And then they might be separated by a quarter mile or a half mile. And so the key part of their conservation is to conserve the wetlands, the individual wetlands, but also this, the stream and the, wet, the stream that they're a part of. And so when I first thought a key part of these wetlands is if they're not stable. They, um, so the wetlands are grassy, but especially in this area in the south, vegetation is very productive. So trees and shrubs are growing rapidly. And so over time, that grassy wetland, which is on the, uh, on the left, will become a forest. And that excludes the food of the butterfly. This butterfly eats um, a, a sedge, so a grassy plant, and the, the trees and shrubs exclude it. Now, the thing that maintains those wetlands open is forces that get rid of those trees and shrubs. And so, it turns out there's two types of natural disturbance, beavers that um, flood areas and take out hardwoods, and then climbers that take out um, trees and shrubs that keep the wetland suitable for the rare butterflies. Now, I'm gonna sort of tell you the history of my first decade working for this butterfly. When I arrived at Fort Bragg, there was um, eight populations of the butterfly that were not living in the bomb range. So that was really our task, <laughs> following the butterfly outside the bomb. And here I am coming into this setting thinking, I'm going to be the one that is helping to conserve and promote these populations. And so what was step number one? Step number one is keep hands off. Like where um, people have changed the landscape, degraded habitats, and caused loss of the butterfly. So I'm just going to keep people out, protect sensitive habitat, and nature will take its course and the butterfly will just do fine. And so here's what I actually saw over the next decade, and that is the loss of a butterfly population, one after another after another. And so all of a sudden, it's like one of these cases of pride goeth before the fall, where I came in, I was a scientist, I knew what I was doing, and yet in reality, I was overseeing their demise. And so here I am with very few butterflies left. So what do I do? I go out and I try to find a different rare butterfly. And so now I go to South Florida and there's um, actually a few rare butterflies here, but one is called the Miami Blue. And the Miami Blue butterfly live almost throughout this picture, the part of Florida that I'm showing. And it mainly lived around coastal reefs. Uh, regions and down into the Keys. Um, but something went awry in about the mid-70s. This this, this um, butterfly was so common that the entomologists living in Florida considered it a weed. They just ignored it. It was so common. And then things changed very rapidly. And so this is an example. This butterfly was found in the Keys where when the Keys got developed, developers scraped all vegetation down to the limestone and then rebuilt on top of it. Um, but there are other reasons, and some are unknown as to why the butterfly began to disappear. And so this is the last five places where the butterfly was known. And it had, and by the way, this is before I got involved, but before <laughs> that, the uh, uh, population started to be lost one by one. And the final sort of death knell was thought to be Hurricane Andrew that crashed into Adams Key and, and took out the last known population. Um, something was happening, by the way, in the early 90s. We do not know what it is, and I'm dying to, to 
solve that puzzle of what happened to the Miami Blue. But nonetheless, fast forwarding, there was a new start because um, nearly a decade later, a new population was discovered in the Keys, um, an accessible key called the Kihanda with a state park. And then another population was discovered on Marquesi Key. And I'll talk about that one in a second, but the kind of intervening stages that I got involved, and somehow when I got involved, the next population went extinct. So something seemed to be following me uh, around these things. So now the butterfly is found in one place, the Marquesas Keys, and that is still true today. And I have this arrow pointed to the Marquesas Keys, and they are tiny places. Um, but they're also nice places. So here's where I have to go do research. I just was there a few weeks ago. And well, in uh, March, in Mich when, when it's March in Michigan, the Marquesa Key is not too bad of a place to go work on butterflies. So we're out estimating their, the size of their populations. We're um, doing work. These are, um, this is my uh, postdoc, Erica Henry, and collaborator Sarah Steele Cabrera searching for eggs and caterpillars of the butterfly, which is, I, I cannot do it. I mean, I know I'm getting older, my sight's going bad, but even despite that, they're phenomenal at finding these things. And so then the goal is to try to understand their populations and keep the butterflies going. Now, this, these are small, tiny islands and if I sort of fast forward into the future, I'm not going to talk much more about this, but the biggest threat to the butterflies is sea level rise. These butterflies are living on land that is about as high as these tabletops, or maybe a little bit higher than that. But in addition to change in the level of the sea, there's also a change in the frequency and intensity of hurricanes. We know that. And so when Hurricane Irma came a, a couple of years, a year and a half ago, we were frightened and I, um, and Erica, about every 48 seconds, I got an update uh, text of a picture of the Weather Channel's view of Hurricane Emmerich barreling down at, at, um, at us and at, at uh, these islands. But there's an interesting thing that happened with Hurricane Irma that has lessons for recovery. And we've not gone to the next steps of recovery, but there are lessons, which is that if we look at the effects of the hurricane on these small keys, one effect is um, salt spray and uh, inundation of the keys. And so that's this picture where the food plant for the butterfly is the dead branches that are sticking up. And this is almost the total width of the habitat on the small island. But then on the right side, there's a different thing that happened with Irma. And that is it dumped sand in a place where there wasn't the sand before. And this becomes the substrate for what will become habitat in the future. And so to me, this was an interesting, I don't know, a surprise or something to look forward to in science about what will cause the loss of habitat as climate change and what will cause the creation of new habitat, hopefully. OK, so what I've been telling you about so far is two butterflies that have, well, they've not done well the time that I've since I've been involved with them. But what I learned then, I start digging into the, into the literature and I find that I'm not alone in looking at what's befalling these rare butterflies. And so one of the um, maybe most well-known case in the science literature of a rare butterfly is this guy, which is called the large blue butterfly. It was found in, um, in England. And this butterfly had been known to be teetering on the edge for about 100 years. And so as I'm thinking around in the literature, I, I find quotes like these. So if you look up in the top left corner, there's the numbers 1884. This quote is from, this title is from 1884 on the probable extinction of, that's the large blue butterfly Britain. Time, they thought it was due to changing um, uh, weather conditions, especially changes in um, frequency of drought. But then now, um, 40 years after that, there's another article that says, will butterfly collectors again be present this year to complete the funeral for the butterfly? People thought butterfly collecting was so intense that it was driving the butterfly 
towards extinction. Well, it turns out, well, the point I want to make here is these might have had influences in various ways, but the, the key point is that this was known over about 100 years, the butterflies decline, and yet still, knowing this was a conservation issue, the problem was not able to be solved despite lots of attention, and the butterfly was lost in 1979. So where am I? Here I feel like, I don't know, you all came, I came to think about butterflies in the spring and the promise that they hold for environment and things around us, but I'm telling you about stories of decline, decline, decline. And so now I'm gonna flip the story a bit because here I am taking my approaches, my knowledge, and seemingly not having good um, the facts for the conservation of the butterfly. But I luckily had students and collaborators who could take the lessons of our failures and see possibilities for recovery going into the future. And so I'm gonna give you a few stories that I am calling loosely resurrection and recovery because some of these butterflies were thought extinct. I mean, it was literally that bad before the restoration was able to happen again. And I'm gonna start by flipping from the last butterfly I told you about the large blue butterfly because I think it presents one of the most interesting cases and in one of the lessons I've learned about conserving rare butterflies. And that is, we have to understand the natural history of the butterfly. And I don't, when I came into this, I was thinking what, I don't know, I think many of you would think that if we know the plant the caterpillar e eats, then we feed or grow that food and the butterfly will go on and do fine. And the problem is it's, not much, oh, it's almost always been more complicated than that, even at the level of knowing what the caterpillar eats. And so lesson number one, understand natural history. And a great case study of this is with the large blue butterfly. So here's what I think about butterflies in their life cycle on the Left is a butterfly feeding it a flower. In the middle, you can't see this, but it's laying an egg. And on the right, there's a, caterp a tiny caterpillar that starts feeding. And we think, ah, that, you know, if we do that, the butterfly should be doing well in his habitat. But there's one stage that was missing in what I just told you, that this butterfly is also associated with an ant. And so this is not uncommon for butterflies. It happens with certain groups where um, the caterpillar secretes a sugary, sugary substance called, that's called honeydew. And the ants feed on it, and the ants can provide protection for the caterpillars. And you know, that seems to make sense. It's an interaction that's beneficial to both species. But there's another layer to this interaction that still blows my mind away. So there's this whole other thing that's happening underground. So the green line is the ground level. So, uh, ants take the caterpillars, carry them underground in their nest, and then the caterpillars eat the eggs and larvae of the ants before then they form a chrysalis and then go back on the upper side again. So in about the 1910s, 19-teens, scientists figured this stuff out. And so it seemed like all the natural history was in place to um, promote the recovery of the butterfly. But in fact, it wasn't because of the little ants there. So I know you can't read that from the back probably, but there's two species of red ants. And the red ants seem very similar, so the butterfly should do fine if those ants are in place. But it turns out that the butterfly only does well when there's one red ant. And so then the question is, when is that one ant there? And it wasn't until after the butterfly was lost or right as it was going extinct that they figured out that what was needed for the presence of ants, this particular ant, was grass that was about one and a half inches high. Too tall, the, the bad ant would be replaced by the other one, the butterfly would be lost. And so what was really figured out is that the grazers in the system. And there's this, what in retrospect looks like, seems like a funny story that what do we think about cows affecting the natural system, right? They've got to be bad. They weren't there when the butterfly was thriving. 
And yet it turns out that cows replace the native grazers that were lost from the system. But what did we do in conservation? We fenced off areas where the butterfly was to keep out cows, to keep out butterflies. And so in fact, conservation was driving the butterfly to extinction. And so then the other kind of flight of hand here is now, now that we've figured this all out, um, notice that the butterfly populations are recovering, even doing better now than they were doing in the 1950s. And the sleight of hand is that a different butterfly was introduced from the mainland to England. It's a different, what we call a subspecies, so a different variety of the same species. And yet now knowing the natural history, we were able to succeed in conservation. So this is one of the most surprising things I learned from my work in conservation of rare butterflies. And that is, you have to kill some butterflies to save all butterflies. And what does this mean? So I told you that when I got started in conservation of the endangered St. Francis Seder, my approach was a hands-off approach. Stay out of nature and it will just naturally cause the conservation of the butterfly. But in fact, the nature that these butterflies typically experience is not a static kind of serene environment. It's actually an environment that is dominated by disturbances that would have been imposed by natural processes. And so what keeps these um, wetlands grassy for this butterfly, um, the St. Francis Seder butterfly? Um, it's the uh, beaver that create ponds and then the butterflies don't live in ponds, they live in what is wet after the pond drains. And then in dry years, fire burns those, those wetlands taking out trees and shrubs. And so those processes aren't helpful for the butterfly. They, in the short term, harm the butterfly lo in, a, in its local environment. But what we want is for those new populations to be created, so that would be where the red dots are on the screen. And then the butterflies disperse from the places that are becoming unsuitable, the green areas to the red areas. And so we have to think about this network where butterflies are um, by the forces, that the forces of disturbance cause harm to some butterflies locally to keep the butterflies persisting in a bigger landscape. And so then what do we do as conservation biologists? Well, we did what my lab could think of at least, which is to become a lab full of beavers. And so what we did is found one of the coolest tools in, in biology, which is what we call an aqua dam. It's basically an inner tube that rolls out as long and as high as you want it. Ours are about, um, about 300 feet long and about three feet high. They impound the water just enough so that grassy wetlands can form behind it. So that's one thing beavers do, create dams. And the other is they remove hardwoods. And so we spent much time in the summers carrying out parts of trees or trees or shrubs to make clearings for the food plants for the butterflies. And so then what's been the effect? So now I'm talking about one population where the butterfly was originally discovered in 1983. Very quickly, the butterfly was lost from that population because that natural process of disturbance was cut out. And then in 2011, my lab became the, um, a lab full of beaver and restored the land. We also introduced new butterflies and now um, we have populations of around 600 to 700 butterflies. And to put this in context, this is about a quarter of the worldwide population of this butterfly that um, is done because of our restoration efforts. And it's an effort that we now think we can extend to a broader region. Okay, so the next, I sort of hinted at this with my last few slides, but it's important to think about conserving a network of habitats for the butterflies. And so now we can't just think about conserving one local population, but many of them that are connected by the ability of the butterflies to disperse between them. And so with the St. Francis Seder butterfly, I've already shown this diagram. We want to conserve many little populations networks so that if one falters, another can succeed and there can be movement between the good and bad places. Um, another example is a rare butterfly 
called Bartram Scrub Hair Streak. I was just in Florida looking at this guy a few weeks ago. And this butterfly lives in two populations. One is in the Florida Keys and the other is in the Everglades. And it turns out this was in, um, and it also lives in habitats that are maintained by natural disturbances, fire. And so this is its food plant called croton. And you can see on the left side what a thriving bush looks like. And on the right side is a place, and, and that's just after a fire. On the right side is a plant that hasn't been disturbed for many years. And you can see that it's becoming a bunch of twigs with just a few leaves hanging on till the very end. So this habitat needs disturbance. Now, on top of this, um, there's another kind of disturbance that happened there a year and a half ago, which is Hurricane Irma. And so here's a view of the winds of Hurricane Irma. Redder means higher winds. And this thing barreled right towards one of the two habitats of the Bartram's hair streak, hair streak which is Big Pine Key. And, um, and then the other population is far away, Everglades National Park. It turns out that, um, that we, since Irma, before Irma, the habitat had already been degrading at Big Pine Key. Since Irma, we've not seen the butterfly. And the um, population that's further from the eye of the hurricane at Everglades is doing better. It's doing fairly well. But a point of showing you this graph um, is two things, or this figure is two things. One is that my, um, my postdoctoral associate, Erica Henry, had already been doing a disturbance experiment in these areas simulating fire. And here's one of the still crazy things that we're trying to piece together. Where she had imposed an experimental disturbance, the plants for the butterfly actually did better after the hurricane than if there was no disturbance. Well, I should say relatively better. And so the interesting thing is by doing the disturbance that should have occurred there naturally, it makes the system more resilient to the disturbance imposed by the hurricane. But my other point was about the connect, interconnectedness of the landscape. Here, the butterfly populations are separated by 100 miles and um, the Bay of Florida. There's going to be no movement of butterflies between the two places. So if, it, if we had a more connected system, then um, maintenance of the whole network would be possible. So then another thing I've learned in the, and my lab has learned in the last 10 years is that there is a great deal of effort required for restoration. It's not just a matter of going out and planting um, the food plants for the butterfly alone. And so I just have a few pictures thinking about the kinds of things we do. A few weeks ago when I was at, in the Florida Keys, uh, the people I, who I was working with were bringing out Miami blue butterflies that they'd grown in a greenhouse and releasing them into a new place to start a new population. But in a lot of cases, that's what we're left with, is moving butterflies around, growing them in greenhouses, and trying to promote their uh, And then often disturbance is important. And so we have to impose controlled fire, fires. And I love this picture because it just looks like so much fun that the person is having, creating a controlled fire. But then the flip side is other kinds of disturbances. This is the picture that doesn't seem like fun, cutting out hardwood trees that shade the understory where the butterfly's food plant lives. Okay, so here I've been telling you about the decline, mainly decline, but also recovery of the rarest butterflies. And I was telling my um, friend, former college roommate, Marcos, um, I was telling him, yeah, you know, I'm working on all these rare butterflies. I think I'm going to write a book about these rare butterflies and about this and that conservation and whatever. And I could see he's kind of nodding along and whatever. He's, he says, Nick, 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 if you want to write a good book, you have to have a good title. Let the last butterfly. And I think, come on, this is like, I'm just studying a few butterflies. What does a few butterflies mean in the context of the rest of butterflies in the region of the world? And so then more recently, my student, a uh, former student, Tyson Weprick, sent me uh, results of analysis he had done working with butterflies from the state of Ohio. And some of you might think about, like, how do we get involved in thinking about recovery or decline of butterflies? This is all data 
collected by people that have an interest in butterflies, they might be scientists, they might not be. It's organized by the Ohio Lepidoptera Society. They have the, every one of these points have butterfly transects, lines over which people walk, count all the butterflies. They do it every week during every growing season and they've done it for the past 20 years. This is a serious butterfly data set. Now, um, when I talk to people about butterflies they see in their yards, and I might have had this conversation with some of you, people say, God, you know, I've been out in my yard and I, I don't see that many butterflies this year. And sometimes people will say, ah, oh, I was out in my yard, I saw a lot of butterflies this year. But maybe 10 to 1 or 20 to 1, people tell me they've seen less butterflies. And I think, yeah, you were out on a good day, bad day, I not belong. And then I see data like Tyson sent me. So this is sort of hot off the presses. This is the number of butterflies counted per minute over the last 20 years. And so now imagine you go out to your garden for a minute, look around, or if I go down to the lakeside here, we have this nice prairie area, I'll look around for a minute. In 1995, I might've counted five butterflies. And in 2015, less than four. So let's put this in perspective. Over that 20 years, if at the start, you went out and saw 10 butterflies in your garden, then you'd expect to, expect to see seven now, which is a huge decline. And it's true ac across many of the butterflies. So we all think about monarchs, right? So we see a decline in the abundance of monarchs. Well, this just matches what we know from the counts that we see from their overwintering areas. Um, but what about other kinds of butterflies? Like this is another butterfly some of you might know. It's called a cabbage white. And so this is a not, an introduced species, introduced along with broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. And so you might, I mean, if you look around, you'll see a white butterfly. But if you look at your garden and look at your cabbage broccoli, you'll see these green caterpillars that are eating it. It's a pest species, right? So a pest species seems like it would thrive with broccoli and cauliflower or whatever, agricultural crops anywhere. But it also is showing a similar kind of decline. So even the species that we might not want are doing poorly. Now, are all butterflies going this direction? The answer is no. And um, so some of you might have seen headlines like these in the last couple of weeks about a mass migration of painted lady butterflies. So some people report that there are a billion of these butterflies in migration right now. And there very well could be. At least there's a very big number. And so if we looked at those data for the Ohio butterflies, we don't see any change over time. We see spikes, just like we're seeing, seeing spikes in California right now. And so this is what we're finding in Ohio. And if you're like me, you're thinking, well, I mean, Michigan has to be doing better. I'm trying to make some analogy to like the sweet six, <laughs> to the sweet 16, like Ohio State didn't make it. Michigan State did. Even Michigan made it. And Ohio State did it. So anyway, we got to be doing better than, than Ohio. But the truth of the matter is, the answer is probably not. Because my student Tyson compiled all the records of these long-term butterfly surveys in the world. And so if you sort of read across the rows, you see the number of years, the number of sites, the number of butterflies in thousands. So we're talking about a million to... Um, in the, in the hundreds of thousands to millions of butterflies counted each year. And in every case, we're seeing a change of 2% decline per year in numbers of butterflies. And if you add this up over 20 to 30 years, we're talking about declines in butterfly abundances of a third to close to a half. The picture is not good. And so, <clears throat> so then the question, you know, I'll get to a little bit, just very briefly, is, you know, what do we do about this? What do we even know? So before that, I want to, I've been talking about the butterflies I've studied, and I want to talk about the butterflies that I've not studied, but I'm interested in learning much more about, which is Michigan's endangered butterflies. So it turns out that Michigan's one of the hot spots in the world for rare butterflies, um, or at least in the country, if not the world. There are three endangered species. I'm just gonna walk through uh, basically a photo and another thing to say about each one. And so I'll start with this guy, Palashik Skipperling. Um, the black dots on this slide 
are the places you could have found Polish Sea Skippling 20 years ago. The blue stars are where you can find it today, at least we hope so. And four of those blue stars are in Michigan. So it actually is here. And I know there's people in the audience who work on this thing and you know, they're as or more frightened than I am about what's happening to this butterfly. Now, when I look at, one, one thing I wanna walk through as I'm thinking about Michigan's butterflies is like, what can we do about this? And when I see a pattern like this, I think at our level, our individual level, there's very little each individual person can do. Because when I see a big pattern like this, I actually hope that it's something that one or a couple things that are very general that we could actually target the cause and then remediate. And so, so when I see something like this, you know, our minds immediately adrift to things like herbicides and pesticides. And so this is from the Ohio data um, related to the sets I just showed you. And it's changes in a, um, use of herbicide. This is Roundup essentially. And pesticides, these are what are known as neonicotinoids. Um, they're changing rapidly. Is this the cause of the um, power seek skipperling decline? Well, we don't know, but it's something that we want to look into. And um, we sort of have a test that's about to come up, which is that um, in Europe, they've banned these neonicotinoids or most of them. And so we'll have at least some way of understanding responses of butterflies or other pollinators too, <coughs> to this. Switching gears, another of um, our rarest butterflies is Mitchell Sater. Turns out there's at least one record of a Mitchell Sater from uh, KBS that was collected about 60 years ago. It's no longer at KBS, unfortunately. But <clears throat> um, this butterfly lives in fen habitats. And so these are wet, mucky areas. They're fed by groundwater. They are um, low in nutrients, and so they sustain a certain um, set of plants, including grasses and sedges that this butterfly feeds on. So then back to the question of, well, what can we do? We, what we do is now at a, maybe a more local level, but not at the level of individual people, but at the level of state regulation, or maybe at the level of um, land conservancies, which work heavily on these things. So here's an example of one um, Fen in Grand Rapids, the Lamberton Lake Fen Nature Preserve. It's owned by the Michigan Conservancy. Um, and so you can see, I, I put the Fen there. Uh, my colleague Steve Hamilton pointed this one out because it represents the threats that can face Fen. So these things are sensitive to water, too much or too little water is a bad thing. And so when homes encroach on where the Fen is, it tends to to affect water dynamics there. When there's a lake nearby and people want a higher or lower level of lake, it changes the nature of the fen. Um, when there are roads here in interstate running by, then um, pollutants can run off from the, um, from the interstate into the wetlands. And so that's this butterfly's facing. Um, <laughs> folks from the uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory who are out here today as well, sent me some updated um, records that show that of the about two dozen populations of this butterfly that were known a couple of decades ago, about a dozen remain. And so this thing is not going in the right direction, but there are conservation organiza organizations here doing important things. And that includes at the Kalamazoo Nature Center where there's an active program to raise the butterflies, to release them in new places that are being restored. Oh, another of the rare butterflies is called Carner Blue. And, you know, go, so this is at an end of where we're doing restoration for the butterfly and doing restoration that is working. And so this guy lives in oh, savannas where um, the butterfly eats a lupin. And what's been learned about their habitats is how to manage them through fire, through getting rid of invasive species. And so my former student, undergraduate student, told me about how when she was in high school, she would go out to, um, to one of the conservation areas in Nuevo, and she'd help with um, cleaning up after controlled fires. She'd 
lead the charge in getting rid of invasive species that were encroaching on the butterfly's habitat. She'd take people on, on tours. So we could go out like I did with my students last summer and see the habitat and see the butterfly. It's doing fairly well in its recovery. Okay, so what I've done so far is giving you examples of the rare butterflies and including the rare Michigan butterflies. But if you're like me, you're asking, well, you know, realistically, what can be done? What can I do? And so I'm just gonna mention a few things. We're lucky that we're here at like this great place that has resources to do more for the rare butterflies and so, or for butterflies in general. So the Michigan Butterfly Network, which is, I think mo they'd say modeled after the Ohio network that I told you about, is based at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. And so they've established this system in 2013, so, so, so six years ago. They're building their network of sites where they're monitoring butterflies. And me or you could get involved in monitoring some of these sites. There's trainings coming up in April and May, and you can find out more about them at michiganbutterfly.org. Um, <clears throat> there's other ways that people can get involved in understanding how butterfly populations are changing. And so there's work called the Monarch um, Larval Monitoring Project. And so these are people who go out and track when they find caterpillars, track their survival over time and how many there are. And there are people here that actually are part of this effort. Um, what I found out last night as I was preparing the talk, I thought, how many people in our area are part of this network? So you can search on a site and every one of those red dots, including at Kelly Bird Sanctuary, um, are involved in taking data on caterpillars. And those data go into science that is done to understand the um, changes in populations of monarchs. And it's including science that's being done at um, by scientists at Michigan State. Um, then, I mean, I'd encourage you all, and I think about this, but I think we all can think better about improving the habitat, even around where we live. And so, I mean, people have asked me tonight, you know, I've got to get this garden started. How do I find or plant milkweed? And I say, I just moved here. I'm trying to do the same thing. So I'll be out there like you all. And I think there's value in increasing habitat for caterpillars, like in milkweed, but also in flowers for other pollinators that we're also worried about. So it's a way for us to become more connected with the natural world around us. And even at a most basic level, I think we can all learn, take time to learn more about butterflies. My view, butterflies are the new birds. There's 70 million bird watchers in the United States. There's maybe 7,000 butterfly watchers, but it's a growing number. And there's um, a book like this one. This is my favorite to see a lot of different species, a lot of different types, and just learn more about the um, butterflies and the natural world around us. And I have to put in a plug for, um, some of you told me you've been to this in March, April at uh, Meyer Gardens. There's the Butterflies of Blooming exhibit. And so there's lots of opportunities to connect even more with e right here in our area. And Kara and I are planning to lead some butterfly nature walks later in the summer or early fall. There's Kara as excited, as, as excited as me almost. Um, so let me just end with a couple notes. One is this, I have told you about rare butterflies and I started this talk by saying, look, I got into butterflies, I ended up studying butterflies, and then here we are with all these news articles about the loss of butterflies, the loss of insects. And when you hear things like the insect apocalypse and insect deaden or all these things that are in the New York Times, I will tell you one, um, one what I think is a truth, which is what we know about insect declines are basically what we know about butterfly declines. We know much more about butterflies than almost any other insects except honeybees, um, maybe some bumblebees, and then of course we know a lot about pest insects. And so what we know is about butterflies, it's a great starting point for leaping forward. But as my colleagues like to here like to tell me, they say, oh, well, you know, think back to 
that famous natural historian Bates, who sort of said what I was thinking, which is that as the laws of nature must be the same for all beings, the conclusion furnished by the butterflies must be applicable to the whole organic world. Therefore, the study of butterflies, creatures selected as the types of airiness and frivolity will someday be valued as one of the most important branches of biological science. Love that quote, love that quote. Um, but I wanna come back to this issue of insect declines, not just butterflies, but more broadly. And this has been in the news a lot lately, and including last week, one of the feature articles in the magazine, The Economist. And The Economist is, whether you read it or not, it's not, you know, liberal, conservative, or whatever. It's, um, I don't know, what do you want to call it? More kind of middle of the road. But it had this story about um, the insect declines and all the science that has been reported about it. And so they say the insect apocalypse is not here, but there are reasons for alarm about the long-term health of many species. And I think this is a good summary because in their very last sentences, they say insects are indicators of ecosystem health. Their decline is a warning to pay attention to it and to do it before it really is too late. And I think that's where we're sitting at a point where, yes, we know insects are declining. Um, we haven't seen the full effects of that, but what I've learned through my research on the rarest butterflies is, yes, through investment in science and understanding and restoration, we can set things on a new path. And so what I wanna end by saying is that when, um, when I thought through not just what I had done with the rarest butterflies, and what, um, what uh, has been learned about other butterflies more generally, I came around to thinking that, you know, my lens through just a few rare butterflies, well, it's really can be more than that because of all, the, um, all that's been learned in the last at least five, six years. And so in the end, my publisher, it turns out, did go with the title of The Last Butterflies. And I initially, I'm an optimistic person, nature, and I view that as so gloomy, but really it's the subtitle that captures my real view, which is that we're here, know that there's a problem, but we, this is one of the great challenges of biology to set things on the right path. And so I'm gonna end there, but I, before I do, I just wanna thank you all for coming, for listening to this. And I think I'm talking for myself, but also on behalf behalf of all KBS to say, you know, our support from the community really matters a lot to us because in the end, we want to be doing science with you, with you and things that um, are exciting to all of you. So thank you for coming. And I guess we're in the discussion part now. So happy to have discussion. And I don't know which one I put down. Maybe this is the one. Nope, that's fine. This one, right? Yes. Okay. Got some questions around the room. I'll kind of do a little circle here. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like you need to be talking to land managers uh, of some of these lands because I'm familiar with uh, Lamberton where you were finding a, a skipper. And I've been out there four oh, it times. It wasn't there. I'm sorry that um, huh? I, I misled on that. Yeah. It's not there. It's not there, okay? Because no. well, we're, we're out there, we're out there burning it and and cutting trees and stuff like that uh, with groups of up to thirty, and we don't know anything about butterflies. Yeah. So the thing is, there are people here that are thinking about restoring um, the Mitchell Sater into places that could have been good habitat or will be in the future. And so I think it's really important the work that you and others. I mean, there are people here in this audience or right now that are um, doing um, just heroic things on behalf of these butterflies. It's just that we're, I think we're all recognizing that we, we, you know, there's a long way to go to see recovery of the butterflies. Nick, you, you showed a slide that had like 2% or 2.2% decline in various locations, multiple countries. 
2% in one year is not much, but 2% in 50 years is like 100%. When, when did that, do you have a sense of when that decline began? We probably don't have data, but do you have a sense of it? So there's, the, the bottom line is no in a general sense. I mean, we know that decline or change began, you know, as long as people have been changing the landscape and then that change is accelerated in various places. But, um, and there, there's been some recent studies to try to get at this from like museum records and other things, but we don't know over the longer term. Even with monarchs, our best records go back about not quite 30 years. And so that's the window. Uh, but we know that as we change landscapes, change has been happening. So I think I, I do think there's an acceleration right now, however. Uh, you mentioned a couple times wetlands, and then you also mentioned uh, the question of what can we as individuals do. And right now, the current administration is in the process of redefining WOTUS, which is the yeah. wetlands of the United States. Uh, and the reason that they're motivated to redefine it is because the previous administration redefined it rather liberally. And so there's issues with that, of course. So my question is, is this... Uh, Oh, right now also in the process of redefining WOTUS, they're right now in the stage of taking public comments. So it's our opportunity to contact the administration through the appropriate website and voice our concern whether we are in favor or for or against redefining and whether liberally or conservatively. So my question is, how important is this redefining of WOTUS to the butterfly populations? And secondly, is it really, do you suppose that it might be beneficial for us individuals to make comments or because it's a, a big administrative thing, is it likely to not be considered? So, I mean, there are other, for, first, the wetland butterflies we're talking about occupy such a small area that um, the, the wetlands are, a lot of them are conserved or have partners that are helping to conserve them, but the area that's really affects the fens themselves is very, can be very large. And so it gets to be very complicated. Um, <clears throat> let's see, you, so there's others in this room, I'm sure, or somewhere that know a lot more about the wetlands where the Mitchell Sater and they could, they could comment about that specifically. Um, but my experience with wetlands you know, I, I, is from North Carolina where I spent 20 years and there, we had a very, um, we had a political system that did not favor, favor a lot of environmental action, except they did have a clean water management trust fund that funded an enormous amount of conservation. And the link there was to water quality for people. And so there are, you know, various dimensions of this that can and should be explored. Okay, I think our last question tonight came from downstairs in the terrace room, and they want to know what disturbance can we do to improve butterfly habitat? So the, there are many disturbances, but I want to tell you about one that I find just fascinating by my colleagues at, uh, on the main campus, Doug Landis and Nate had a study completed where they found that milkweed that has been disturbed. So for example, they just cut off or mowed down milkweed and then let it regrow. That female um, um, monarchs favored putting their eggs on those disturbed plants. And that even beyond that, there were few predator, fewer predators on those disturbed plants. So it's this fascinating case where, well, how do we disturb milkweeds? We disturb them now by mowing or other mechanical actions. Herbivores could have or would have disturbed them in the past. But so then here I am talking about these very peculiar cases of, you know, a rare butterfly that depends on beaver dams or um, um, a rare butterfly that depends on fires coming through. But here's a case where a very common butterfly that has a very extensive range might also depend on a kind of difference to its habitat. So. I would say I wouldn't mow down all your milkweed, but I would, I, I think it is worth clipping off some stems. And then, you know, if you get involved in the Monarch Larval Monitoring Program, you can 
track them and see how they do yourselves. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for tonight's talk. Thanks everybody for coming. Info tables outside. Dr. Haddad will be up here with a few more questions. Leave your emails on the table. Drive safe. Thank you everybody.